to the running. I'm Alex. This is Bree. Um, Bree, can you go over your Twitter and website real quick? Um, my Twitter Twitter handle is love to Bree. Um, um, sorry, <laughs> Bree B R E. And my blog is run to live dot webs plural dot com. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, Bree. Um, Thanks for having me. It's always she's going to be our next for Tuesday talks. Um, some of the things we're going to go over today is just she finished in third place um, for the females and 17th overall at her last 50 miler and then also last year she did a, a roughly 115 mile e expedition over in Botswana. Um, so let, let's just go to the 50 miler. Which, which 50 miler did you do and just kind of go throughout that day? I did um, the North Country Run in Manistee in Michigan. It was a Western States 100 qualifying race. Um, it was my first official 50 miler that I had actually raced. Prior to that, I'd only done ultras on my own. I had run 50 miles on my own at a point before that um, the previous year. But it's um, completely all trails, and it was really cool because we had a awesome surprise. Um, Marshall Ulrich, um, who ran across the United States, actually did like an opening ceremony type thing, and he led us around. Um, the parking lot on a four-wheeler before um, the race started and then we went into the woods and it was roughly a 25 mile loop that you did twice so that was pretty cool awesome and just so for your so the difference between a 50 miler how, how many did you how many training 50 milers did you do prior to that race um i hadn't run 50 mi any up to 50 miles in training that year I did a marathon in May, one in June, and a trail marathon in July. Um, I qualified for Boston both in the May and June marathons, and then um, I did decently in the um, trail marathon in July, and then I raced the 50 miler in August. Um, but the year before, um, 2011, I ran from Grand Rapids, Michigan to the Mackinac Bridge in five days. Um, so it's roughly 200 miles. I ran 50 miles on the first day, 45 on the second, something like 20 and then 30 and then 20. I can't remember the exact numbers, but, um, I covered that in my blog. Um, so I had done like my own mini expedition prior to that. And it was a fundraiser for the Michigan Tech, um, rowing club, which I am a part of, um, also to promote physical fitness on campus. Awesome. So... For your 50 miler, um, we discussed prior just a lot of a little bit of the nutrition. Um, mostly, when I talk about nutrition, I say you know I talk you know I use a lot of nutrition, especially I don't know if it's me being a guy or me just I like to eat while I run and or drink uh, a lot of different calories, no. a lot of different types of calories. Um, Bree was saying earlier she doesn't use that much nutrition, so just go over your nutrition for your 50 mile race that you got third place in. Yeah, no, I think I'm kind of um, an outlier on most of the scales because um, I don't use any Gatorade. It makes me throw up. I don't use Powerade. I don't use any powdered drinks or electrolytes whatsoever. Um, even though it was like 90 degrees out, all I had was water. And I had one pack of Goo Chomps in the first um, 25 miles, and then I just had Goo Packets throughout the rest of the race. And I, can't, I only had like four Goo Packets after that, I think. Um, I don't really need much, and... To be frank, if I eat too much, like my stomach starts to hurt, and I've had stomach issues in races in the past. But um, mm -hmm. that what works to me, that's what works for me, and you know everyone's different. So you have to find what works for yourself in your own race. Yeah. And how is that? How is that different? Because you did the the Botswana um, Impossible to Possible Botswana expedition. Um, how does how does your nutrition work there versus a fifty mile race? Yeah, that was that was really tough. We were going a lot slower. And um, we were in the desert. So while where I'm in Michigan, where it's like 80% humidity most of the time over the summer, it was like, oh, hey, 20% humidity. There's like nothing there. And it was <laughs> dirt, dry, and 100 degrees each day. Um, I was drinking a lot more water. I still didn't drink any Gatorade, but they were concerned about electrolytes. So they had a lot of salty snacks. So we had like peanuts that were covered in salt. They had chips. They had cookies. And I'm just thinking, oh, my God, I don't want to eat any of this. A, it's not healthy. B, it's going to upset my stomach. And I didn't pack any goo. They had these nut butters, which were um, kind of cool. Um, they came in like a gel type pack, but they were really hard to open when you were running. Um 
So the expedition was one of those times where it's like, okay, I just got to suck it up and go with what they give me. Um, it's not what I would have picked for myself, but I didn't have any problems. I um, had a little bit of trouble the second day. Um, my legs felt really good until just before lunch, and then I started getting, they started feeling like lactic acid, and they were just dragging, and I slowed down, I think, at one point to like four kilometers an hour. It was awful, and I, it, I felt like I was going the best that I could after holding like a nine to ten minute mile for most of the morning, and um, they were worried that um, I was being dehydrated, that I wasn't getting enough water, that my kidneys were suffering because they said that lactic acid feeling can actually be a sign of poor kidney function. So before they let me um, leave lunch, they like, sat me down and were like, okay, you have an hour to go to the bathroom. Here's a bottle of Gatorade and here's coffee. Drink them both. <laughs> and it was the worst thing ever, but I drank them. And then I was able to get back to running and all was well. <laughs> so... Well, you should come out here and run in Arizona. It's like a zero degree, like zero percent humidity, a hundred percent of the time. I will be this summer. I will be in Marenzi, Arizona. Oh man! Um, so I will. Um, I have an internship out in Arizona this summer, which should be really cool. And I plan on taking a trip to volunteer at Badwater. Oh, awesome. Well, get, get ready for the zero percent humidity. <laughs> so it'll be, it'll be. It'll be a good time every day. So um, for Impossible to Possible, though, can you kind of just go over how the process? Um, for any of the younger viewers that we have out there, um, what does it take to, you know, app from application process all the way till you know, through the end of Botswana, what, just kind of what happened? Right. So um, Impossible to Possible takes students usually ages between 17 and 21 abroad, um, or this next expedition is actually going to be in Utah, but they're based out of Canada. And um, you go to a place with an objective that surrounds some sort of learning objective um, because they integrate these experiences into the classroom. Like for Botswana, we are focusing on water quality, water supply and issue, um, biodiversity and plants and wildlife. Um, so these students go to these places and while teaching students in the classrooms and communicating through Skype um, or video conferencing with students back in the U.S. and Canada, you're running an ultra marathon a day, um, kind of to show that what you think is impossible is actually possible, mm -hmm. um, using that metaphor. So the applications are on the Impossible to Possible website, and you can apply. Um, it's kind of preferable if you've had like athletic experience or mm -hmm. are a runner, but they have taken people who aren't runners who have only run like a 10K and they give you a training program. And if you follow the training program, you're going to be good. I mean, you just have to put the time and effort into it. And what they're looking for are people who are passionate, who have passion for teaching, educating, inspiring. It's all about getting out there and sh saying, hey, this is what's up, like, mm -hmm. this is the water situation in Botswana, and we're running 50 kilometers, and sometimes it sucks, sometimes it's awesome, and we're learning to work as a team and taking away life experiences, and we're hoping to teach this to students back in the classroom. Um, so if you're interested in doing something like that, then ITP is definitely a program for you. So. The application process, you fill out the application online, then you can get a phone interview, and there's um, several different interviews that you go through, and if you're selected, then you have like the weekly phone conferences with your team, and you work with them to kind of get to know people before you're just thrown into the situation, um, and you're given a training plan, so you kind of report back on that. And how, um, how far and do you run with that team, because, you know, throwing in with that team, imagine trying to run with brand new people, how far do you run every single day about? Um, between marathon distance and 50 kilometers, so between 43 and 50 kilometers. So you're spending a lot of time with them, and it's not just the time that you spend running, it's the time you set, spend setting up camp and breaking down camp and going over the video footage that you took during the day because you're filming the different things that you see. Like you run up on a watering hole, 
oh, look, there's cows around this watering hole. Well, I wonder what the water quality is. Maybe we should take a sample. Maybe we should talk about what we're seeing here. Um, you run into a village, oh, let's ask these people where do they get their water from. So you're not just running. You're actually educating. You're learning. Um, and you're taking footage, and then you're sharing it. So, But you're also working. It's not just the students that are there. You have the education team and the support crew. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes into the whole expedition that you don't really see when you're just looking at the online portal. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, so kind of to move on, um, you did the 50 mile race was your last race in, in 2012, correct? That is correct. And then, um, looking forward to 2013, uh, I'm, you're moving to Arizona for a bit. Um, what other races do you have coming up in 2013 that you'd really like to highlight? Um, right now I'm signed up for the Zumbro 100 in Minnesota. Um, I think that starts April 12th. Um, so that's about a six hour drive from school. So I'll take a couple of days off from school to go do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I have an internship that's really important to me in Arizona. So I kind of have rearranged my race schedule. So I'm not racing during the summer. Mm -hmm. Um, so I can focus on the internship, but I will take time to go volunteer at Badwater because my ultimate goal for this year is to, um, qualify for Badwater next year. Um, I'm not sure after this past Badwater and this coming Badwater if I would be correct in believing that the youngest female finisher for Badwater is 23 years old. Um, if I, there's a lot of ifs. <laughs> there is a lot of ifs <laughs> in my plan, running, but so far is. so good. So um, if I qualify for Badwater this year and if I get accepted into it next year, then and if I finish Badwater next year, then I will finish it when I'm 21 years old and be the youngest female finisher. Awesome. That's a lot of ifs and we'll just see if it goes to plan, but that is, that's the goal. But if that doesn't work out, you know, it's okay. Um, I would just really love to run Badwater cause it's just one of those iconic races and you get so many amazing people there. I mean, you have to be amazing to uh -huh. just want to go to death Valley and run 135 miles. Yeah. So right in a car next to someone that's running as well. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, what, so what race would you qualify for Badwater with? Um, you actually have to, there's um, different qualifying standards and you can look at them on the Badwater website, but one of the options is to have completed three 100 milers in under the cutoff time. Okay. So my goal this year is to run three 100 milers in under the cutoff time. So okay. right now I um, have the Zero 100 in April lined up and then I have um, another one in Minnesota and... Uh, another one in Alabama that I picked out. The um, Superior Races is the one in Minnesota, and it's a point-to-point. -point. And then the one in Alabama is, I'm sorry if I'm butchering it, but Pin Pinote. Okay. Not sure how to pronounce I'll, it. I'll have to look them up. I'm a West Coast but guy. It's um September-November races, so okay. I'm hoping that they're spaced well enough. But, you know, like, it'd be kind of cool because if you, like, kind of a little lead up to, hey, what if you want to go for the Grand Slam someday? I don't know. Oh, man. Oh, well. There's for, just so for, many things on well, the to-do list. Okay, so for, for my viewers out there, because many of them are ultra runners, what is the ultra running Grand Slam then? Ultra running Grand Slam is completing the four um, iconic 100 races um, in June, July, I'm oh, sorry, yeah. It's the first one in June? Or no, is it? Western States would be in June. I don't yeah, remember Western States. One. I think in Leadville. It's Leadville and then... Um, Wasatch. Or Vermont. Yeah, I was going to butcher that word too. I can't <laughs> pronounce things. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, okay. Um, so, you're, so that's another goal for you in the future? Oh, that doesn't even tip the iceberg of goals, but, like, I don't want to, like, publicly announce them all just so I don't end up doing them, you know? Like, yeah. it's one of those things. There's there's just so many ifs in life, and that's one of the things I really admire about some ultra runners is how they're able to balance, like, family, work, and ultra running and do well in each of them, or, you know, so it seems. Yeah. You don't know personally, but, like... um. 
I'm in my junior year, so I'll be graduating in three semesters, and it would be really nice to have a job that I really enjoy. I mean, I'm in environmental engineering, and I went into environmental engineering because I want to have a positive impact on the way um, people develop and are manufacturing, just to help the environment in that manner, lessen our impact. Mm -hmm. But um, I also really want to do well in ultra running, and finding that balance as a student is really difficult because school doesn't give you the flexibility nope. to take time off. Uh -huh. Kind of discovered that with missing three weeks with ITP, but I caught up, and my GPA only suffered .01. <laughs> um, so I'm not complaining, but it's difficult, and um, we'll just see where life goes. So. Okay, um, and then the kind of last thing I wanted to go over is just because I'm a, definitely a gear nerd. Um, for Impossible to Possible, did you, you, you had a cruise, you said, so I don't, you probably didn't carry much, if anything, while you were running, I would assume. We carried an iPhone to send tweets and take pictures. We carried a tracker, um, which linked back to, like, the iPhone. Um, we carried a walkie-talkie and a satellite phone. And then you carried any food that you wanted, and we carried water. We had um, two liter bladders in um, a hydration pack, and then we had um, Oakley sunglasses. And oh, one of us wore a Garmin GPS watch. And other than that, you could carry whatever you wanted. I mean, do you normally know <laughs> run the pack when you do an ultra run, or you're just a handheld or? What do you I am actually, um, I got a Camelback about, um, two years ago, and I've been using it pretty religiously, mm -hmm. um, until I started, um, until the 50 miler, let's just say, after racing that, I was like, oh my god, I was overheating, and I took it off for a little bit and ran with it in front of me, mm -hmm. and it was incredible how much like my pace picked up. I was like, oh my goodness. And so this is the year of me trying to move more to the handheld. So, um, well, good luck. You are a rower, so there's muscles there. Yeah, yeah. rowing's actually mostly legs. Yeah, well, that's true, I guess. But you still use some arms. Yeah, okay. some. I was what a coxswain it? this year. It kind of wasn't oh, my forte. Yeah. Yeah. I was coxing because... um. Coxswains are the people who sit at the back of the boat and tell the rowers what to do. They're like the the coach in the boat. But mm -hmm. um, I was coxing so I wouldn't be overtraining mm -hmm. because rowing coincided with training for Botswana. Okay. And coming off of the... Botswana was an end of October, November, and coming off of the 50-miler in August, I can give much recovery and then build back up time. And I felt that training with rowing would kind of be too much. Yeah. Okay, so then, um, so, um, you mentioned you run in three different types of shoes. Um, first, I just want to ask, what would, what type of shoes do you run in over in Botswana? Do you use the same pair every single day? I mean, it's a desert, so they probably dried out. Um, um, it actually wasn't bad. I wore my New Balance 110s for the most part. I flew over in my, um, Vibram Five Fingers. Great for wearing on airplanes, except that they kind of, like, make a nice little bubble around you because people are like, oh, those smell. Stay at a distance. <laughs> but, um, and then um, when I was running in Botswana, I actually wore um, my New Balance 110s, and they did great, except that by the third day, my the bottoms of my feet felt really bruised. And mm -hmm. talking with Bob, um, who is the co-founder of ITP, he's like, yeah, the soles of those are pretty thin, and you might have burned the bottoms of your feet, and it could just be... <laughs> that there, it was actually, like, for all the sand that there was, it was pretty rocky, and I think it was just being on your feet all day. Yeah. Um, but then the last day, I actually switched over to um, my Saucony Canvara 2s um, just to have a little bit of cushioning, but those things will be two years old in May. They have yeah. well over 2,000 miles on them, and the, like, front webbing is pretty much all gone. And so it was kind of like sand comes in, and then I would take my foot up and just tip it forward, and the sand would all drop out the front of the shoe. <laughs> and um, I just needed it the last day because, you know, there's, like, virtually no toe box there anymore. Like, I felt like one of my toes had fallen off of my sock and was just floating around. I was like, oh, this feels amazing right now. 
scrape your teeth and run harder, right? <laughs> and so for your road races, do you use you use your uh, New Balance One Tens as well? No, um, I've been using the Saucony Combaros, um, but they are so beaten up, and I really needed new shoes. Except that I couldn't really afford shoes. I'm sure if I asked my parents, they would be more than happy to help me invest in the pair of shoes, but. Um, I really like the climb and it's an online discount oh, okay. thing and I built up, you can build up credit if you invite people mm -hmm. on there, but, um, I built up some credit on there and I actually ended up buying, um, these, um, Vivo barefoot shoes okay, and okay. I've read really good reviews about them online and I actually just got them in the mail today. So oh, I'm nice. really excited to go try them. They're a trail shoe. Um, and because I'm just, I I'm avoiding roads like <laughs> like everything right now. They're just not fun anymore. I'm sure I'll go back to them at some point, but okay. Um, and then, well, just because that brings me to mind. So, speed work. Do you do any type of speed work with running, or you just do it all on the trails, or um, um tempos? I like tempo runs. I do uh, tempo once a week, um, and then hill repeats. Okay, and you do those. That's on the so are, so are the trails out there, because the, the problem with tempo running in Arizona, and especially southern Arizona where I'm at, people say it's flat, and that is a misstatement, that you cannot run a tempo run here that doesn't have a hill involved in it. So is it is it flat enough over there that you could do a tempo run at a decent pace, or you just kind of have to go by feeling, more or less? Yes, um, it's pretty hilly here, um, except that... We are on the Portage, which is, um, it's not a river and it's not a lake, but it connects, um, cause I'm kind of on a peninsula and it connects Lake Superior, Superior on either side of the peninsula. And if you run on the path along the Portage, it's like a very slight incline. Um, and I almost feel like I'm cheating when I run on the out because it's yeah. like slight incline downhill and I can run like if I'm doing like a six mile tempo, I can run like a sub six minute mile for the first two <laughs> miles just because of that slight downhill. And I feel like such a beast. And then I die on the way back. I'm like, nope, yeah. eight minute miles now. I'll take the average. <laughs> exactly. Seven minute, oh, minute mile tempo is good. Yep. Yep. That sounds good. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Uh, definitely. Um, remember to check Brie out um, on her Twitter, which is. Um, Love to Brie, B R E. And then um, also check out her blog um, at what is it? What is your blog? <laughs> Run two as in the number um, live dot webs w e b s dot com. Awesome. And then also uh, make sure to check out Impossible to Possible. I'll put a link below. Um, and mostly Impossible to Possible stuff you've done. You posted it on your blog, correct? Yep, I have the day by day blog. If you want to read about all the aches and pains and. <laughs> complaints that I have, but also a lot of the lessons learned. Okay, awesome. And then, um, any other sites you want to share or anything else? Oh, man, putting me on the spot. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but I definitely update my, or try to update my blog on a regular basis, so if there's anything, it'll be on there. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks for watching, everybody. Um, be uh, looking forward to another Tuesday Talk. Um, I have a, well, at least one other person lined up. Uh, again, thanks to Bree for coming on. Um, until next time.